A common patriotic question we ask among ourselves is, who is your hero? As we age, our perspectives are altered. At youth, we claim animated figures or sports superstars as our idols. During our teen years, we believe our parents are our heroes, and most of us have a detailed reason as to why. But it is the young adult stage where we make our final decision, the moment in life where our minds have matured far more greatly than before. A greater question lies above all others. What is a hero? Although this question usually differs amongst people, I have finally found my own answer. I believe heroes are individuals that make it their life's pursuit to service humanity in the best way possible. The person I selected for this situation is Steve Jobs. This innovative and well-admired mastermind was the co-founder and CEO of Apple. Jobs revolutionized the world we live in. The impact his company made and the potential that it can still make is incredible. Apple is currently on track to being the first American trillion dollar company. Steve Jobs had a dream and he was determined to see that dream come true. People admire those who can chase their dreams instead of continuing to dream. This is where the twist in this presentation comes about. Steve Jobs, in my eyes, is no hero. He is just another successful, money-hungry businessman. How Steve Jobs became successful is never discussed fully. So let me take you into the real Steve Jobs so you can evaluate for yourselves if he should be considered a hero. Let's start with the hard topics first. Earlier I stated heroes service humanity in their best way possible. You would think that the hero would ensure this statement is completely true for family, but nope. A little known fact about Steve Jobs is that he personally did not care about his daughter at the beginning of his relationship. Steve Jobs didn't want anything to do with his daughter. He even denied being the father after a positive paternity test. This highly loved billionaire was giving Chrisanne Brennan, his ex, $500 a month for child support. Of course, this wasn't enough, so she ended up on welfare. To his credit, he did eventually assist them and begin accepting his daughter into his family, uh, eventually. Chrisanne Brennan explains their nuanced and difficult relationship in her book, The Bite and the Apple. Again, let's remember my definition of a hero. An individual who services humanity in their best way possible. While accumulating billions and billions of dollars, Steve Jobs was never tied to a charity. Although there is speculations that Jobs was privately donating money, there was never any documentation of him doing anything. Even if he was, why privately donate money? If you're trying to help a cause, let the world be aware of it so they can contribute as well. The world needs more than one hero. Speaking officially, the fact that Steve Jobs gave no money to any known charity or any unknown charity and kept it all for himself is a very selfish act. I don't know any selfish heroes. In order for Steve Jobs to succeed like he did, he burned a lot of bridges along the way. For those who know the real Steve Jobs, he was strongly known for being a jerk to many people. One great example was a phone conversation he had with Lee Clow. When Apple was set to reveal the Bondi Blue iMac, Clow said he was berated by Jobs. Jobs believed Clow's team got the wrong color for the print ads. Jobs shouted, you guys don't know what you're doing. I'm going to get someone else to do the ads because this is fucked up. In the end, Clow had a meeting with Jobs and displayed what the team actually had versus what Jobs wanted. Jobs immediately backed down, realizing Clow's team was on track with what they were doing. Another great example of how Steve Jobs treated people around him terribly was presented by Walter Isaacson. In his biography, Isaacson said, when it comes to Steve Jobs, there is a good Steve and a bad Steve. In his biography, he recalls a situation where a partner of Apple was not performing adequately. VLSI Technology, a company that delivered chips to Apple, was having trouble delivering enough chips on time on a certain occasion. Walter then explains how Steve Jobs stormed into a meeting with them and started shouting many insulting profanities, rushing them to get it done. The company eventually delivered the chips on time, but look at the disrespect Jobs showed. Instead of trying to come to a mutual solution, 
Jobs negatively forced the issue with unnecessary insults. This man is not a hero. He is a money first, people second type guy. I would have never thought people would consider this man a hero without knowing the truth about him. Because in all honesty, speaking from a personal perspective, advancing technology is only hurting us more. Having hearing some of this information, do you really consider this man a suitable hero? Think about what he has done. He has revolutionized technology. Good job. But if we open our eyes, we'll be able to see that that only hurts us. The phones, the television sets, the tablets, and don't forget the computers are all things we can barely live without. Some of us can't even go on without them. We miss life messages looking for text messages. We as people are forgetting the basic principles that make us human because of technology. For example, we are slowly forgetting how to spell thanks to the lovely spell checker on our devices. And not to mention we've fallen off socially. A successful date is now considered a couple that could stay off their phones. Steve Jobs has done nothing more but feed our addiction. His mission to enhance our everyday use of our lovely handheld devices may sound good, but truly hurt us more. So for those who consider Jobs a true American, please reconsider placing him on that pedestal. The thing that led to the uh, huge disagreement, because uh, I'm almost surprised that people never ask the question, how could two individuals like Steve Jobs and I, who were s supposedly inseparable, we were together all the time, we were great uh, personal friends, how could we end up in one of these amazing celebrated um, clashes? And it was pretty simple. I came from a world of um, public company accountability to a board, to shareholders. And when the Macintosh office, uh, which was the next version of the Mac that was introduced in 1985, uh, failed, uh, Steve went into a, a deep depression over it. Because uh, this was really important to him. And it really wasn't his fault. It was all about Moore's Law. And Moore's Law is a very predictable, consistent, uh, law that says that every roughly uh, 12 to 18 months the number of transistors doubles and therefore the performance uh, processing power of a computer doubles. And the reality was that the Macintosh office just was not powerful enough, had nothing to do with Apple, it had to do with the stage of where a microprocessor technology was. It just couldn't do very much and it was being called a toy, it was being ridiculed in the market. Uh, we did just introduced laser printing. Uh, to print beautiful fonts. It was slow. And Steve was discouraged. And so Steve uh, came to me and he said, <clears throat> uh, I want to drop the price <clears throat> of the Macintosh <clears throat> and I want to move the advertising, sh shift a large portion of it away from the Apple II over to the Mac. And I said, Steve, <clears throat> it's not going to make any difference. Uh, the reason the Mac is not selling has nothing to do with the price or with the advertising. And if you do that, uh, we risk throwing the company in, into a loss. Um, and he just totally disagreed with me. And so I said, well, I'm going to go to the board. And he said, I don't believe you'll do it. And I said, watch me. And so we went to the board of directors. <clears throat> and we each presented our case. And the board met with us each individually. And then they assigned the vice chairman, third co-founder of Apple, Mike Markula, to go and study the question and talk to various executives and engineers, and then come back, not to me, not to Steve, but come back to the board and give his report. And Mike Markla did that. And about uh, seven or eight days later, he came back to the, the board. He said, uh, I agree with John. I don't agree with Steve. And so the board uh, then brought Steve and me together. And they said, Steve, we want you to step down from running the Macintosh division, not get fired. You know, you're still chairman, you're still the largest shareholder, uh, but not, not get fired.